I'm super excited to talk to you about Vault. Um, just kind of before we get started, how many people here have heard of Vault before? Okay, a fair number. How many people work in some type of security related field, including software engineering? Cool. So uh, do not forget to engage and rate this session and ask questions on the GoTo app. So this is me. Uh, my name is Seth Vargo. I'm a uh, software engineer and open source advocate at HashiCorp. How many people have heard of HashiCorp before? Cool. Um, so this is our logo. Uh, if you haven't heard of us before or seen what we've done before, um, but you might be familiar with some of the open source projects that we make, like Vagrant Packer, Surf, Console, Terraform, and most recently, Vault. Um, so Vagrant is a development environment. Uh, automation tool, Packer is a build environment automation tool. Surf is low-level gossip protocols, console service discovery and orchestration. Uh, Terraform is provisioning infrastructure. And then Vault is uh, managing secrets on both a small and large scale. So let's talk about secret management. Uh, and I want to talk about secret management pre-Vault. So for the next, well, let's say 10 minutes, let's just assume Vault doesn't exist and that this is six months ago before Vault existed. What is a secret? And I think this, this is different for every person. Like, what do you consider secret information? I think there are some really obvious answers, like database passwords. But then there are things that we consider sensitive that aren't necessarily secret. Right? So would you consider something like a customer phone number a secret piece of information? Probably not. But it's sensitive. It could cause personal harm to that customer if that information is made available. So let's look at some examples. When we talk about secret data, we have some very obvious things like database credentials, SSL CA certs, your you know, AWS access keys, uh, encryption keys, even things less obvious like the Wi-Fi password or source control. And we do a really good job of keeping those secret. We put them under lock and key. We only share them with the people that need to have access to them. But on the flip side, we have sensitive information which traditionally our industry has not protected very well. Things like phone numbers, your mother's maiden name. Why is that one so important? Well, that's the number one security question uh, in the world. <laughs> uh, email addresses, which we traditionally store in plain text so that we can grab those back out and send some marketing email. The marketing department really likes to have those emails available to them. Things like our data center locations. Doesn't seem you know, too terrible to have the data center, oh yeah, we're in you know, Arizona somewhere. Um, customer personally identifiable information, so things like home addresses, phone numbers, uh, anything that uniquely identifies a customer. Lastly, things like email and chat, our Slack, our internal communications. Uh, how well do we secure those? And more so, how well do we protect them? Uh, my laptop is sitting over there, unlocked. Someone could walk up, press the escape key, and how difficult would it be for them to access my company email or my company chat? Um, you know, we've seen incidents where iPhones have been left at bars and it happened to be the new version of the iPhone and that cost companies like Apple a lot of money because of the uh, too soon of a release. So we need to do a better job of sensitive information keeping. So I think as an industry, we're really good at this. Um, we have some pretty decent solutions around secret management when it comes to what we traditionally view as a secret. But I think as an industry, we're very bad or unaware of the way that we treat sensitive data. I like to have a different definition, um, and I think this really hits home for a number of people. It doesn't matter whether the data is secret or sensitive. Um, I consider a piece of information secret if releasing it would cause it to hit the news in some type of negative way. Um, and I think one of the prime examples of that is most recently like Ashley Madison. So obviously Ashley Madison had some secret problems they made their database accessible. Um, attackers were able to gain access to that database, and as a result, they had a dump of the database. That's obviously a vulnerability. However, the information in that database was sensitive. 
the names and contact information of the people who are interested in having an affair was all just stored in plain text. And I think our systems are designed like this a little bit today. I think most corporate enterprises look something like this. We have this giant external firewall that has maybe a few security gates, but once you're inside the, you know, the demilitarized zone, once you're inside the military fort, we don't have a lot of secure uh, controls of who can access what. It's kind of like once you're in the data center, we trust all of the traffic. Uh, once you know, we assume that everything comes from the application. And I think we need to design our data centers a little bit more like this, um, where each individual component is not only surrounded by this giant external firewall um, or series of firewalls, but that each component is doing validation. Each component says, okay, I trust the information you're giving me, and I trust that I can exchange information with you. And that's kind of what SSL was built on, was this trust model. So let's talk about secret management 1.0. So we have these secrets, like database credentials. Uh, how do we get those into an application? So traditionally, the answer there has been you either hard code them, um, or you use something like configuration management to lay them down at runtime. But more importantly, how do humans acquire those secrets? So you have operators and application engineers, and they need to get access to those secrets so that they can do their job. They might need to be digging into the production database. They might need to be um, relaying something to perhaps reproduce a bug so that they can fix it on the software end. How do we invalidate those secrets? So how do they get updated? So if I hand you the database password, how long is that good for? Is that good until we rotate the database password? What are the policies around rotating the database password? That comes back to the next two questions, which is when we rotate the database password, how do we make sure that the humans and the applications have the new version and that they're still authorized to communicate with that database? It's a very unsolved problem right now. And then lastly, let's say someone leaves the company, there's a malicious attack. How do we remove all of those secrets? How do we make sure that even if our database credentials are leaked, we have the opportunity to shut everything down before the database dump can be acquired? So this is traditional uh, secret management. You just hard code it in the config. Um, maybe you're using environment variables if you're doing like a 12-factor app. Um, but even then, if someone gains access to the system, they can just dump the environment. So why isn't configuration management a good solution for dropping off secrets? Well, I think first and most importantly, uh, it's centrally stored. So if you're using something like Chef or Puppet or Ansible or Salt, um, whether you're using like their server edition, so all of your secrets are stored on the Chef server, or if you're just using the, uh, the freemium and where all your secrets are stored in something like Git or SCM. So you're checking in secrets uh, into a system that wasn't actually designed to be secret. So things like Chef encrypted data bags um, have known vulnerabilities. And the community, for example, has come up with alternatives because of the security vulnerabilities in Chef encrypted data bags. So it's proven that they're not a great solution for storing secrets, more so the authentication procedures with who can connect to the Chef server, who can connect with the Puppet server, uh, is also not 100% secure. So it's possible for a rogue client to join a cluster and potentially gain access to secrets that it shouldn't have had access to. Just by pretending to be part of the cluster, writing out those secrets to a file, and then reading them straight from disk. It's eventually consistent. So if you're running Chef or Puppet on some type of interval, it takes 15 minutes. 30 minutes until that uh, a convergence change has happened. So that means if right now you have a database breach and you need to completely change all of your database passwords and rotate everything, you have to wait 15 to 20 minutes or 30 minutes, or you have to force a configuration management run across your entire cloud. And this, this poses lots of problems if you have a number of servers. For example, you might be introducing a thunder and herd problem. You might not actually converge. And at some point, your application is going to be communicating with bad database credentials until that convergence happens. There's no access controls, or very little access controls. But more importantly, there's no auditing around those access controls. So who accessed a secret? Why did they access it? How long did they access it? What did they use it for? These are all questions that we asked. And when we talk about, I know we're in the lean track, but when we talk about rugged, somebody said something um, uh, two days ago that really struck with me, which is, you're never really going to be able to prevent all of these attacks. 
the, the value is that you want to make it so difficult that people choose a different and alternative route. That hackers choose something different because you've made it so difficult for them to hack you technologically. So they'll resort to something like a social engineering attack instead. When that happens, auditing and access controls are super important. It's very important that you're able to track all of this because in the event of a security vulnerability, the last thing you ever want to have in a press release is we don't know what happened. Um, it's much better to come out and say, here's where our vulnerability was, here's how we assessed it, here's how we mitigated it. And lastly, there's no support for revocation. So if you delete the Chef encrypted data bag or uh, you know, remove the, the puppet manifest, all of the machines that have been provisioned already have access to that secret storage environment. So there's no way to revoke that. So why not something like an online database? Zookeeper, those types of things. Um, they're not designed for this. So at HashiCorp, we believe in the Unix philosophy, which is do one thing and do it really well. And you would never expect LS to create a file for you. And we like to take that same approach with our tools. And things like Postgres and console aren't designed to be a secret storage engine. Or if they do, those actors are very, very small in scope. They're typically stored in plain text. Um, a number of these have the ability to be encrypted, but they're not encrypted by default. So that means that if you're using them for secret storage, you have to go above and beyond the traditional setup just to get the added level of security that you need. And then lastly, very few of them have any type of auditing or revocation abilities built in. You have to build custom Postgres extensions. You have to write tooling around console to make that possible. So <clears throat> another question is how do we handle the secret sprawl, um, which is in a large organization, we talk about human humans, operators, developers, and machines having access to secrets, how do we deal with the fact that there are secrets everywhere? And most importantly, what do we do in the event of a compromise? What is our break glass procedure? So we see some anomalous logs and think someone might have gained unauthorized access to one of our systems. What do we do? What does that break glass procedure look like? And most importantly, how does that break glass procedure affect the rest of our application, the rest of our environment? Is it going to take down production? Are we able to recover quickly? And a lot of the existing systems can't answer that question. They don't know the attack surface. They don't know who's accessing a secret. So it's difficult to have a break glass procedure. So if we talk about the state of the world pre-vault, we have a lot of secret sprawl. Who has keys? Why do they have them? What are they using them for? With very little auditing or visibility. We have these decentralized key storage in potentially multiple systems. Um, and lastly, we have the, this poorly defined break glass procedure. And, and in security, uh, it's kind of terrible to say, but you have to optimize for the worst case scenario. It's a field where the thing that can happen will always happen. Best to optimize for those scenarios, like the break glass procedures. So let's talk about secret management 2.0. Uh, we were really aware of a lot of these problems. Uh, it was problems we were facing internally. So we maintain an enterprise application called Atlas. Anybody heard of Atlas before? Cool. Uh, so Atlas, the way Atlas works is you have to give us your cloud credentials. That's pretty scary, right? Like we're going to provision your infrastructure and manage your infrastructure for you, but as a result, you have to give us your cloud credentials, which means we have to create a system that you can trust us enough to give us your GCE file or to give us your AWS access keys. And that's a difficult trust to build. So instead of building some complex Postgres extensions and blogging about it, we decided to make a tool. And we made that tool after talking to a number of customers. And we realized that pretty much everybody has very similar problems. They're just thinking about them in different ways. So we came up with a list of goals. The first goal was Vault needed to be the single source of truth for secrets. And Vault could be backed by another storage engine that you might be familiar with, something like Postgres or Console. But Vault itself needed to be the entry point for secrets. We needed to have programmatic application access. So tools like Chef and Puppet needed to be able to access those secrets via some type of authentication that proved access to them. But that whole process needed to be automated. We can't have manual configuration in the modern world. It doesn't scale. We needed also to have manual access, though. So operators need to be able to go in and get database credentials or get an API access key they can replay an attack, or so that they can potentially debug some type of issue in production. Um, 
Additionally, it's not listed here, but developers might need access, but they might need a different level of access. So operators might have a full open view of everything, but developers can only access some key secrets in the organization. It had to be practical, and this is really open-ended, but what it really boiled down to was that it had to work out of the box. A lot of the existing secret management systems were black boxes. You deployed them, and this is what you could do, and it was very much an entry point, and you were done. Uh, and out of that came the fact that it had to be open source. Uh, and being open source provides two advantages. First, it means that you can dive into the code right now, and you could take a look, and you can find any security vulnerabilities that you might want, and you can assess it. Most other security tools aren't open source, and they won't provide you with the security assessment if one was done. The second thing that came out of practical security was the user experience. So we put a lot of time and effort into the tool to make sure that it's easy to use out of the box, but scales to hundreds of thousands of devices or servers accessing secrets. And lastly, it had to be modern data center friendly, um, or as the, the term that I've had uh, heard thrown around a number of times here is that it had to be uh, cloud ready or a, a cloud ready application. So what are some of the features of Vault? Um, Vault is a secure secret storage mechanism, and you can use in memory, uh, which we can talk about a little bit. Console, uh, you can use a file system based uh, Postgres, and we're adding more and more. The community is interested in more and more. There's a Zookeeper backend now as well. One thing that really separates Vault from the existing secret management tools is that we have this notion of dynamic secrets. So when you traditionally think about a storage, a secret storage engine, you put secrets in and you pull them out. You think of something like last pass, one password, keep pass. An operator types some secret in or copy and paste from a web form, and they put it under this database type thing. And then when they want to retrieve it, there's ACLs around it. They put a password in that's the master password, and they get the data out. We didn't think that was sustainable, so we took a different approach. So Vault has the ability to create and dynamically distribute secrets. And I'll show a demo of that here in a little bit. But basically with Vault, you can point Vault to a Postgres server. You give Vault root access to your Postgres database. And you tell it, hey, when somebody reads from this endpoint with an authorized token, give them credentials. And those credentials have an expiration. They have a renewal interval, kind of like a TTL. And they can be revoked at any time. And they can be revoked on a prefix at any time. So what this means is operators no longer have to worry about generating secrets. Vault can do that for them. In fact, the applications themselves can request unique database credentials. So if you imagine you're running a Python application or a Rails application on 500 servers, each of those 500 servers can uniquely request database credentials. And in the event of a compromise, not only do you have the auditing and ACLs in place, but you have the ability to go back and find out exactly which server was compromised based on the credentials that were used. We needed built-in support for things like leasing, renewal, and revocation, as well as key rotation, which was just recently added. Uh, we needed the auditing and the ACL support, as I've already explained. And lastly, and most importantly, is we needed the ability to work with everything. So initially, we looked at something like gRPC, if you're familiar with gRPC. Um, it's Go's protocol for inter-process communication. And eventually, we just settled on an HTTP API. And the reason for that is even though HTTP APIs are traditionally slower, the, the restful area is a bit um, overblown at the moment, uh, modern tools in pretty much every language work with some type of HTTP API. In fact, at the end of the day, you can always resort to curl to get secrets from Vault, um, and you can get that information out in JSON and pipe it to something like JQ. Um, but we also have first-class support for things like Ruby. Uh, so we have the Vault Ruby client. There's a Node.js client, a Python client, um, the official Go client, uh, and there's a Rails client as well. And the community is working on more and more. So in order for the tool to explode, we realized that in our environment, we had to provide a flexible way to get secrets. So we chose an HTTP API for that. As far as secret storage is concerned, um, data is encrypted at transit and at rest. Since steps the vault, it is encrypted, and it is encrypted on disk or in memory, et cetera. Um, everything's 256 AES GCM. Um, we enforce TLS 1.2, so no SSL v3. Um, if you try to communicate with vault, it will not downgrade your SSL protocol. It will just reject your request. Um, and then there's no HSM required. And this is both a positive and a negative. Um, a lot of people have this notion that HSMs are like the future, and they add a whole lot of entropy. We found that that's actually not true. 
uh, at the end of the day, you can get more energy with a really good software algorithm as opposed to an HSM, which adds very little, if any, entropy to a system. Um, and entropy is important in secret uh, generation. So we don't yet have support for HSMs. We're going to add support for HSMs because a number of customers have requested it. But what we found is that in showing them map, the map, um, we can typically change their mind because a uh, software-defined algorithm can actually have more entropy. So uh, I had slides in case my demo didn't work, but I'm going to switch to demo mode. Um, can we turn that light off? So I decided that instead of uh, instead of going through a whole bunch of static slides, that I would just actually show you Vault. Um, so what I've done here is I've kind of prepared a little script to set up Vault for me. Um, this is just a bash script that I'm happy to show you. So this is just a bash script that's basically starting Vault and creating a whole bunch of backends. For me, um, so you can see that it's it has set up the AWS backend, the Postgres backend, the Transit backend, etc. So uh, what I want to show here is the very basic Vault use case. So I'm going to tell Vault where I live, or where the Vault server lives. Um, and now I can check the Vault. So um, this notion. Of um, master key, and then uh, you can create key holders using uh, Shamir secret sharing. So uh, this eliminates the whole one person has access to everything. So in the event of a compromise, you can seal the vault, and it requires a quorum of key holders that are set up whenever vault is configured to unseal the vault. So for example, at HashiCorp, there are five people who have uh, keys, um, and I like to use the analogy if you've ever seen like a movie where people capture the president and like three people have to like type in their access codes to disarm the nuclear bomb. Um, that's actually how Vault works. Um, it's very, very similar. Like five people have access codes and three people need to type them in in order to unseal the Vault. Um, and all of that's configurable at boot time. You can have a hundred keys with two people who need to unseal or you can have one key with one person who needs to unseal. Um, but we definitely recommend a higher number than one and one. Um, I could seal the vault right now and then unseal it, but I don't want to do that. Uh, instead, I want to show you kind of writing to the generic backend. So by default, without mounting anything, a vault behaves very similarly to something like LastPass or 1Password. So you have the ability to just write. Um, and this is actually just post command with curl. It's hap well, not with curl, but like curl under the hood. So I can write um, to secret and then the name of a secret. So in this case, I'll write to foo. And I can say... Data. So all of the um, all of the data that gets written to the secret store is in a key equals value format, and that'll actually come back as JSON. So if I did this right, I did uh, the data was written secret foo, and the way I can get that data back is the exact opposite. And you can see we get a little bit more information back than we did when we wrote the data. So we get this lease ID, lease duration, and whether the lease is renewable or not. We'll talk about renewable in a little bit because it'll make more sense in a different context. Um, the lease ID and the lease duration actually uniquely identify this lease. So we have the ability to revoke this secret without actually knowing its contents. So this means that we can safely store that UUID somewhere else, and in the event of a compromise, we can revoke that UUID, and Vault will know what secret it maps to. So we don't have to know exactly that the secret is named foo. All we need to know is the UUID. Um, the ability to output this as JSON, which is super useful for things like automation. Um, and a lot of the, the scripts that I'll show you here today, I use a tool called JQ, um, which will allow me to like pull the data out um, at zip, for example. Um, so this is a really easy way to get the data out of Vault, put data into Vault. Um, you can write, uh, you can't write files, but you can write from a file. So if you have a bunch of k equals value pairs in a file, you can use the at sign, um, and Vault will read each of them in and create the value out of that. So that's the generic backend. It behaves very similarly to something like one password. You just give it a password uh, at a particular key, and then you get attributes back out. Um,
Cool. So the next thing I would like to show is the transit endpoint. So how many people are familiar with Amazon's KMS? Okay. So the transit endpoint behaves very similarly to Amazon's KMS. The notion is that Vault is going to maintain this encryption key. So this is where Vault acts as an encryption service. And this is super useful for things like web applications or client applications. Traditionally, your web application needs to know the encryption key. So you have sensitive information, maybe it's a credit card number or even something like a phone number that you want to encrypt in the database. But you want to store that encryption key offline. You don't want your web application having access to the encryption keys because if someone compromises the database or the web application, they have everything all in one. You want to uh, make the attack surface as distributed as possible so that multiple systems have to be compromised in order to actually have a successful attack. Vault provides this encryption as a service and the way it does this is through the transit backend. So Vault is going to create an encryption key for us. And then all we do is we write data to Vault. And the response is the encrypted data. And then we store that in our database. And any time we want access to the unencrypted data, we write with the encrypted data. And Vault gives us back the unencrypted data, assuming we're still authorized to do so. So if you have an application that is behaving roguely, you can revoke that application's access. And when it says, hey, decrypt this secret, Vault just says no. So what that means is your applications need to be resilient to that. And if you're using any of the official plugins, they, their built-in resilience is there. It'll just return like the empty value and log an exception as opposed to like freaking out. But I'll show you the application that I built today that will freak out just for the purposes of the demo that shows you what happens whenever the key has been revoked. So if we take a look at the uh, transit setup, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm writing to the uh, transit encrypt demo with a plain text value, and then I'm going to output that ciphertext value. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run that. And you can see we got back this kind of goggly goop. Um, Vault will prefix anything that comes from the transit backend. In fact, it'll prefix a lot of its secrets with an indicator that says, hey, this is from Vault. And this is version 0 of the cipher. Um, the next version of Vault, 0 0.3, is going to support inline key rotation. So that version of the cipher is super important. So the next version of Vault, if you want to rotate your key, uh, the, the web application would say, hey, Vault, decrypt this data. And Vault would say, oh, this looks like the old cipher. I'm going to decrypt it, re-encrypt it with the old key, and I'll give you back not only the plain text value, but the new cipher text value that has the new encryption algorithm. So this means you can do online key rotation without any interruption. In fact, your developers don't even need to be aware of it. So let's take a look at what this might look like in something like a Rails application. So I put together this little Rails application yesterday which stores all of my friends and their credit card numbers. Um, I don't know about you, but I really like to keep my friends' credit card numbers on, on hand just in case I need to buy something on Amazon. Um, so. Um, okay, I don't know why it's not working, but the demo gods are not with me this morning. Um, I can move on to the next one, hopefully figure out why this one's not working. Um, but basically what I was going to show you is that the application will encrypt the data and it'll store in the database, it only stores the encrypted value, but we're able to get the plain text value back by querying vault. Um, but I have some other demos, and then we can come back to this if there's time. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is the actual dynamic secret generation. Um, and this is where Vault is very, very different than any secret management tool. So let's take a look at something like Postgres. So here what I'm doing is I'm telling Postgres, hey, like, I want you to give me credentials. But I'm doing that through Vault. So in that setup script, what I did was I, I gave Vault access to database kind of as the root user, as the Postgres user, which has the equivalent of sudo in Postgres land. That means it can create databases, create users, etc. And I read from the Postgres path, you can mount multiple paths. What I'm going to get back is a unique set of credentials that have a certain expiration. So I'll go ahead and run this just to show you what happens. 
Um, so you'll notice that we got back the, um, don't worry about the host, but this is the username and password that we got back from Postgres. And then I just connected with Postgres. So this is actually a remote PSQL instance that's running on EC2 somewhere. Um, and I have the ability to uh, list all of the databases. Um, this user actually only has read-only access. So we set up the template so that any credentials that get read from uh, cred slash read-only endpoint, get credentials that are read-only. You can imagine this is a scenario that's great for something like application developers, where they want to be able to go in and debug the database, they want to inspect some values, potentially diagnose an issue, but you don't want them to be able to do anything damaging. You just want them to be able to read data. So with their token, they might be, only, might be able to generate read-only um, values. So I'm just going to copy this here. We will quit Postgres. So I can read this any number of times. And you'll notice that the value we're getting back is different every time. So if you look at this username password, it's constantly changing. If I went into Postgres right now and I list the users, we would see a user for each of these. Now, after I think I set it for 15 minutes, but whatever the least duration is, if these secrets haven't renewed themselves, uh, I'm sorry, it's one day, 3,600. If, uh, if they haven't renewed themselves in that time frame, Vault will revoke them. So what that means is your application needs to have intelligence to say, almost like a TTL, hey, I'm still using this secret. And it does that on some interval. We recommend least duration over two. So you would renew every 1,800 seconds, in this case, instead of 3,600. So every 1,800 seconds, you have a background job that pings Vault and says, hey, I'm still using this secret. And that'll reset kind of the countdown clock, if you will, of this secret. If that hits zero, there's two ways that that secret is revoked. First, Vault uses a write-ahead log, so even in the event that um, something terrible would happen, Vault could roll back in the issue of failure. But we also create the Postgres user with an expiration. So when the backend that supports it uh, has the functionality, Vault will create the user with an expiration. If someone an attacker is able to completely sabotage Vault, the Postgres user itself is created with, um, I'll show you here, the valid until clause. And that expiration value comes from Vault. It's based off of that least duration. So that means that even if Vault completely goes offline, I could completely tear down this particular Vault instance, Postgres will still expire those users after 3,600 seconds. So we have that double layer of security that even if Vault itself is compromised, the secrets can still be revoked if the storage backend supports it. Um, so for every, every um, value that we're getting back, this is creating a new user, and if I leave this run for an hour, um, those users will all be in Vault's log. You'll actually see revoked, 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 um, and you can see the renewals that are taking place if the application is renewing. So I think a, kind of the obvious question then is how do we get these secrets onto like our application? Um, and you have a couple ways. So you could use something straight up like curl and grab the JSON output, um, put it on disk, or we have a tool which is console template, which will actually allow us to uh, pull values from Vault directly onto the file system. And you can change the permissions on those files so that only the application can read them. You can also pull things into the environment with other tools um, that are not console template. So if I look at this uh, console template, uh, basically what we're doing here is we're querying Vault for the passwords key, and then we're grabbing the data at go to. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I have to actually create this password. So I'll do Vault write um, secret passwords. What do we want our go-to password to be? Go to London, okay. I'm doing this to prove to you that this isn't just some elaborate scheme that I've pre-recorded. Um, so now if I run this uh, template.h, you can see that it's actually pulling out that password. Um, and obviously that was very quickly because it's communicating locally, but if we change this password, it'll automatically update. Very similar to the edge tracking that happens in console template with console. And the uh, advantage here is that console template is actually doing that, re that uh, lease renewal inter interval in the background for us. 
So you could actually replace this with something like reading from Postgres creds read only. So if I edit this, and instead of reading from secret passwords, I could read from Postgres creds read only. And I think it's username. Ah. Uh, well, I could use the wrong key, but this is actually querying for new Postgres credentials. So every time this actually asks for a new value, it'll get new Postgres credentials. But once it has the credentials, it'll renew them. So this means that your application could use something like console template to request secrets, assuming it has the proper authorization. And then once it has the secret, the, like something like console template or Vault Ruby or Vault Rails would be responsible for renewing it in the background. It has built-in support for that, so you don't have to worry about the complexity there. Um, <clears throat> so this is great for something like, you imagine like a Rails application, you'd be writing out your, your database YAML file so that you have the ability to uh, have dynamically generated secrets without the application needing to have all of this intricate knowledge of how Vault works. You just give it a path, you read from that path, and you get secrets back. Um, so it looks like I'm actually right at time, so we're not going to have a chance to go back to the... Um, template demo, but I'll, I'll get it working and uh, tweet out the URL so that everybody can take a look at it and you can put your friend's credit card numbers in for me. Um, if you want, it's totally optional. Um, I think, I don't know if we have, do we have time for questions, Martin? No. The idea is that there's a whole lot of the next stuff from the app. Okay. Oh, we have 20 minutes. Well, there are no questions in the app, so I'm happy to take real life questions. Yeah, in the back. So, who's using this in production at the minute? Do you want me to repeat that? I can. So, uh, the question was this was an impressive talk. Thank you. Uh, who's using Vault in production? Um, this is a difficult question to answer uh, because a lot of the customers who are using Vault that are impressive have asked not to be named. Um, there's a very large coupon manufacturer that's based in the United States. Um, there are a number of uh, financial service firms that I will not mention expressed a lot of interest in Vault, and I think the majority of them are now running it in production. Um, a lot of the 0 0.3 features are as a result of uh, enterprises running this in production. We obviously use Vault in production. Atlas is, all of the keys that you add to Atlas are encrypted in Vault. And I have a very detailed blog post about how that works and the architecture um, on the HashiCorp blog if you're interested in reading like the nitty gritty technical details of how that exchange happens. Um, Vault is a weird one. So for other open source um, products, a lot of people are like, yeah, we totally use Vagrant. Um, you find when you get into the security space, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the ways that organizations protect themselves is by not telling what tools you're using because that's a potential attack vector. So if I know that you're using LastPass, I might be able to exploit the vulnerability the same way that if I know you're using an unpatched version of OpenSSL, I might be able to exploit a vulnerability. So they're very less open to talking about who's using it. Um, I can say that uh, on the day of release, um, it had over 2,000 stars on GitHub, um, and it continues to grow. It's one of our most quickly growing open source projects. We hired a full-time engineer to work on it. Um, so it's definitely popular. It's used by a number of people. I just can't really talk about a lot of them. Other questions? I thought I saw one over here. Go ahead. So when you're talking about the dynamic secrets and stuff, I guess you have to, I mean, you had a couple of scripts there. Is that like a, a sort of hook point that it calls out to? I think really quite understand what's going on. So if I have my own database and I want to like dynamic secrets, obviously I've got to provide Vault with a way to create new secrets inside that. How do I do that? Yeah, so I did that in the setup script. But I, I didn't really go through it for uh, two reasons. So first of all, um, the reason that I use scripts is because I can't type and talk at the same time. Um, I've done it before, and it, it doesn't work out very well. So it's much easier for me just to, instead of you watching me typo 30 times, um, it's a much smoother demo if I just have the scripts pre-filled uh, pre out. But um, if we just go through this file here, where do I do it? 
Um, oh, I didn't show the AWS demo. So you can dynamically generate AWS keys too. Um, but here's where I set up the Postgres backend. So these lines here. And you can see what we're doing is, uh, so we mount the Postgres backend, and then I give it my connection. So, so the backend's actually, I thought the backend was storing secrets, but the backend's actually what you want to talk to. Both. Um, so we have a PostgreSQL backend, which is where you can store secrets. And then we have a PostgreSQL secret backend, that is how you can generate dynamic secrets from Postgres. Um, we've talked about renaming it, but it's actually both. So you can use Postgres to store vault data the same way you could use the file system or in memory, but you can also use Postgres and we support MySQL and Cassandra to dynamically generate secrets using vault. So you give vault kind of the keys to the kingdom and you say, hey, manage Postgres credentials for me and you tell vault how to do that. So like um, if you go to this RDS instance, you can log in with the username vault and the password is vault password. Obviously very secure. Um, and like I've configured all of this for you, um, and then you, you tell Vault how to create um, the, the users. So you're telling Vault at the read-only endpoint, so when someone reads from read-only, um, I want to create them a user, and then I only grant them uh, select on all tables in the public schema. So we're restricting them to select instead of um, the ability to modify tables. And that's like Postgres specific. Right, so the, the question is, um, this template needs to be stored securely because it has the credentials to the vault. Um, in general, you would actually put this in a template. An operator would configure um, by typing something into the configuring vault. Um, there's, there's a number of ways to configure vault. Um, internally, we use a private GitHub repo that has our configuration in it, and then um, for like things like Postgres, uh, we have an, an out-of-band storage engine that pulls that data in um, at reprovision time. But once it's configured, you no longer have to do this. And even if Vault is turned off, if you're using a persistent backend, so anything other than in memory, when it comes back online, it knows all of this information. It's all encrypted at rest. Um, so you only have to configure it once. So ideally, you would actually never put it in a template unless you were doing like a disaster recovery thing. I just made this template because watching me type all of this stuff out would have been boring for you and very embarrassing for me. I can show you the AWS backend if you're interested in that. Um, that's actually super useful for developers. Um, so what I have is uh, a policy here. Uh, if you're familiar with AWS, it's just an IAM policy for developers. So what I'm doing is, uh, in short, I'm forcing two-factor authentication. So I'm saying you cannot use our production infrastructure unless you have two-factor auth enabled. Pretty basic, but uh, point. So this allows anything on EC2 um, if the developer has two-factor auth. And if I um, will read AWS creds developer, I'll get back life access keys. Um, so that's an, if you're familiar with AWS, that's an access key ID and a secret access key. And that has uh, access to my personal EC2 or my personal AWS account. Please don't go Bitcoin mining. Um, if you have two-factor authentication enabled, um, which like the developer who actually requested these would need to have two-factor authentication enabled or else it'll reject the actual creation on, at the EC2 level. So the AMI or the IAM policy will actually reject creation unless the user using these credentials has the two-factor auth enabled. Um, and then I have another one for assets, which I, I won't show you, but I'll just show you the policy. Um, so uh, these are just IAM policies, and this is a, something you could use for like a system that uploaded assets. Maybe it's like a CI server that compiles your JavaScript and uploads it to some bucket on S3. You could have that system dynamically get secrets from the assets endpoint. Um, and the, the only thing that you change there is instead of reading from creds developer, you read from creds assets, you get different credentials back. And these credentials will expire in one hour if they're not renewed. So I don't even have to go delete them, they'll just expire. And when they expire, they'll automatically re be removed from AWS and from Vault. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. 
Um, in terms of um, the generation of the keys and stuff, uh, does Vault also do uh, generation of SSL certs? Yes. So uh, one thing I did not show because uh, it's really complicated and assumes you have kind of a deep knowledge of how PKI works is Vault can actually act as a CA. So if you give Vault uh, a CA certificate, people, people or computers can request um, certificates from Vault. And not only can they use that to authenticate with, but you imagine most, most organizations have to distribute SSL certificates onto client machines if they're doing termination on something other than like a load balancer. And getting that information from Vault as a CA is actually super helpful. Uh, we do this internally. You can also authenticate with Vault using a certificate. Um, so that's the flip side of things. So in addition to being able to generate certificates and then write those to disk, you can actually authenticate with Vault using a certificate um, with like client certificate exchange, um, private public key, those types of things. You can authenticate with Vault using GitHub. Um, this is how our internal stuff works. So um, we have people who are in a team on GitHub, and only people who are in the team are able to have root access to Vault. Everybody else has um, what's just considered developer access to Vault, which means they're a much smaller scope. Um, and you have full control over the ACLs that you set up in Vault. Um, you just give it a policy and you tell it's all path based. So if you don't want developers to be able to touch the AWS backend, it's deny by default. So you can give them access to a particular point. And as long as their key fits within that role, they'll have access to it. Um, the only exception is the root key um, or root keys, which can do anything. So those initial five or 100 or one operators have kind of un, uh, unfederated access. Everything's logged and audited, but um, it's usually recommended that you take that root key and you put it on like a USB drive in a safe. Um, and then you give like a GitHub authentication back and a username password authentication uh, to operators. And you can still tie them to a pseudo policy, but um, they don't have that root credential, which is like the keys to the kingdom. Yeah. Regarding revoking access to secrets, um, are credentials required to do that? Is a core required? And can they be reinstated? Okay, so the question is, uh, with regards to revoking secrets, um, is quorum required? And the answer is, is no. I'll talk about leader election in a second. Um, it, are ACLs required? So yes, you have to have, so everything involved is a free. Um, so the path is very specific. So like Postgres creds read only. Um, you have to have access to either that element. So you can revoke a token that, or a, a key that you've created. So I could revoke anything I created here. I also happen to be logged in as the root to Vault right now, so I can delete anything. Um, if I'm logged in as a developer, I can delete things that I've created and things that fall under my tree. Um, so there's a command called like revoke tree in the API that will literally revoke everything you've created. But I can't revoke someone else's keys unless I'm above them. So it's very similar to like an organizational hierarchy in a way. Um, what was your third? Point. No. Um, so once they're deleted, they're deleted. Um, you can generate new ones. And the, the notion is that the same way we throw away infrastructure, we talk about immutable infrastructure, we throw away infrastructure, we're starting to think about secrets the same way. Right? We have these dynamically generated secrets, and we really don't care what the database password is as long as it's valid. So if you accidentally revoke a key, you just reauthorize the access, and the application will just generate new credentials. And you're like, OK, whatever, it's a new password, I don't care. And those passwords have a very high degree of entropy. Um, as far as is quorum required, um, so Vault will support HA mode. Oh, are you talking about quorum about people or quorum about computers? If it was quorum about people, but okay. I'm interested in that. Answer. Okay, so no quorum of people is not involved. The only time a quorum of people is involved is when the Vault is sealed. It takes whatever the key threshold is to unlock the Vault. Um, as far as Quorum goes with HA, so Vault does support HA, but it has to be backed by a backend that supports leader election. So Console, Zookeeper, I think are the only two that can do HA. Um, and it, it's a very primitive HA. We're going to improve it in the future. But um, you don't require a Quorum to do anything. So uh, one of them is elected a leader. The followers will forward requests to the leader. Um, Vault 03 will have a few read requests that the followers can respond to to take the load off the leader. Um, but write requests will all forward to the leader. Um, if the leader goes down, um, you know, something like console lock or zookeeper lock would just elect a new leader, um, and then requests would start going to that one. So it's a very basic leader election algorithm. Um, 
but you're only ever writing to one server. And right now, you only ever read from one server unless you're running on like Vault Master. Other questions, comments, complaints, concerns? Cool, well, I don't have anything else. Um, feel free to find me. Um, I'll be around for the next like four or five hours, and then I gotta go catch a flight um, back to the US. But feel free to ping me on Twitter, um, or you can email me. I'm Seth Vargo on the internet. I'm Seth Vargo at HashiCorp. Um, so if you have any questions or you want follow-up, um, I will publish the demo materials um, probably on GitHub somewhere, and I'll tweet that link out shortly. Um, so if you're interested in diving into my terrible shell scripts, you're more than welcome to do so. Cool. Thank you.